You're listening to the Huddle Up! Podcast with Chad Jensen and Zach Kelberman. Join Broncos Country's deep divers at milehighhuddle.com and sound off. And now it's time to drop some knowledge. Okay, we're live, but we do have to let the stream breathe just for a second. We got to bring in our Facebook peeps. Bear with us just for a couple more moments, and we're good. Welcome in, everybody, to the Huddle Up podcast presented, as always, by Mile High Huddle and powered by Overtime Media. I'm your host, Chad Jensen. With me, as always, my partner in crime. You know him, you love him. He is Zach Kelberman. Zach, today, I mean, yesterday was a busy news day, but today was even more busy. Yesterday, word broke that the Philadelphia Eagles had parted ways with Philly Will, Will Parks, of course, the Philadelphia native that the Broncos drafted in the sixth round back in 2016, and they let him walk this year. He signed a one-year deal with with the Eagles. They cut him, Yep, ends up on waivers, and the Broncos signed him, well, claimed him or awarded him off waivers today. Do you think the Broncos put in that waiver claim if Bryce Callahan doesn't injure his foot on Sunday? I, I do. I don't think the Broncos ever wanted him to get away. I just think they never wanted him to pay a market value contract for a third safety. And he only signed a one and a half million dollar contract with the Eagles. But who is your third safety now? I mean, they downgraded with they have PJ Locke and they have Trey Marshall. Will Parks is better than both of them. And he works on specials. The Bryce Callahan injury, it coincides with that. I think he can play some cornerback. He can help out in the secondary. But regardless, this is a player that the Broncos coaches like. It's a player that thrived under Vic Fangio last year. The fan base loves. You can get him back for nothing off waivers. The Broncos are very fortuitous because um, the Minnesota Vikings put in a waiver claim. The 49ers put in a waiver claim. He was a hot commodity on the waiver wire market, and the Broncos got him back. So I like this move a lot. I just so happened to be... It was a rare moment in which I was on Instagram. I, Instagram is one of these social media channels. I consider myself relatively proficient with social media, but Instagram is just one I, I have a hard time with. But I'm on there checking out Mile High Huddle, and it just so happened Will Parks was streaming live, and this is, you know, maybe, I don't know, probably an hour actually after the news broke that he had uh, been claimed by the Broncos. Man, he was fired up at the end. He's talking about, uh, you know, what do he say, snapping necks or breaking necks or something like that, just – how motivated and, and excited he is to come Sounds back like to, to Denver. So very interesting development there. Bryce Callahan, you had the the article up at milehighhuddle.com yeah. going on injured reserve. So here we are sitting at week 13, 13, 14, 15. Best case scenario with that foot is they might be able to get him back week 15 or week 16, week 17. If there's a reason to, What's the what's the update on that? Well, it's a different injury to a different foot. So at least he re- avoided re-aggravation. And uh, it, it is a foot injury and it's worrisome, but at least it wasn't a continuance of last year. Uh, he'll have to miss, like you just mentioned, at least three games in IR now. And Chad, if the Broncos are out of contention, what's the point in chancing him? He he, he showed what he can do. He played at an all-pro level. It sucks for him. He's He should be a pro bowler, but the Broncos can see if he could just stay on the field at $7 million a year. He's a bargain. He's a perfect replacement for Chris Harris Jr., if they're not in the playoff hunt, though, which they won't be, what's the point of chancing that? So he might have played, I think, his final snap of the season. But, man, what a year it was for Callahan in Denver. Yep, such a shame, man. That's just another another one bites the dust. You know, I was writing about this the other day in terms of some of the calls for Fangio's head. The rumor, that's another thing that I think the building the Broncos guys did a pretty good job of tackling yesterday, one of the juicy pieces of news that emerged – And honestly, Zach, it wasn't news. No one was reporting. Here's what's so crazy about this. No one reported, none, not a person, that Vic Fangio was on the hot seat. No insider anywhere across the NFL reported that any inside or special information that Fangio was suddenly on the hot seat. But where are we? We're in December. And so NFL national guys, they, you know, they get to December and they go, all right, let's take a look at the standings. All right. Below 500, below 500. Who are the? I need a, a nice generic list article of the head coaches that are that are going to be on the hot seat. And so, of course, Fangio makes a couple of those lists. One from uh, CBS Sports, very generic. The guy writing that article has no idea what's going on in Denver. And then John Clayton, Shocker. but neither one said what I've heard is Vic Fangio's on the on the outs. It was just simply that, hey man, you know, one plus one equals two. The Broncos are sitting here at four and seven. He could be on the hot seat. 
And in writing about that, about why Fangio, uh, it wasn't necessarily a defense of Fangio on my part, Zach. It was more about why my my read on this situation is that Elway and Ellis are more inclined to view 2020 as a mulligan, provided they survive. And there's no reason why they wouldn't survive. Nobody fires themselves until there's an ownership change. That's the regime. But for them to be looking at 2020 as a mulligan for Fangio because of all these just outlier uh, factors, including the the pandemic that affected the offseason and then that, how that affected injuries and personnel. I mean, the laundry list of stars this team has lost to injury, it, it's staggering, Zach. Yeah, I, I was asked this question on Twitter. Can you address the rumors? And I'm with you. I didn't even see a concrete report. I saw, I can't remember who said it, but the tweet was basically saying if, Vic, if the rumors are true, uh, a team should snap up Vic Fangio as a defensive coordinator, which I agree with. But we've been steadfast in saying that he gets 2020 and he gets 2021 regardless. And like you mentioned yesterday on Twitter, Elway hitched his wagon to Fangio's star. They're tied together now and they're going to, you know, either thrive together or go down together. Once Vaughn, though, went down, once Sutton went down, once his quarterback went down, that was his built-in alibi. He was always going to get a pass whether you like it or not. You throw in the pandemic, you throw in the other injuries, and what can he possibly do? It's a tough situation for any any coach, and uh, he and always seems to have respect for Fangio and in the process he's bringing to Dove Valley. I don't think he's going anywhere, Chad, and these rumors are very unfounded. I and mean, we're in that season now, going into December now. Into January, into the offseason, a PSA for Broncos country, don't believe or buy into every rumor you see. A lot are very, very much false. Both Zach and myself have been in the belly of the beast when it comes to big national sports media companies and those newsrooms. And this time of year, you know, the the editorial brainstorming, these are one of the creative uh, go-tos for every newsroom that covers the NFL across the uh, fruited plane. And that is, you know, hey, let's make a list of – head coaches who are, could be on the hot seat. And so it's, I understand it's kind of lazy to name Vic Fangio because you, you would have to kind of know what's going on in Denver um, to really have the, the the lay of the land there, but it's easy to just point to the Denver Broncos at four and seven and go, Oh, Vic Fangio is a second year head coach. Ain't getting it done. Probably going to be on the outs, but there's literally nothing. And all the insiders, the actual guys plugged in the, closest to Dove Valley. I'm talking about Benjamin Albright's. Mike Kliss was mum on the topic, and that tells you a lot right there. But Benjamin Albright on Twitter uh, refuted that multiple times uh, on Tuesday. So we still have so much to get to tonight. We are just getting started, boys and girls. So get your questions in, whatever might be on your mind topics. We have a lot of topics we're going we're gonna to break down, Zach and myself. I see a super chat from Dave, from George. We're going to get to you here in just a second, my friend. Before we do all that, gang, we have to take care of a couple of quick matters of business. Yes, guys, as always, as you know, four times a week, tonight's live stream podcast is brought to you by sportsbetting.com. Broncos country, listen up. As you may well know, gambling is now legal in the state of Colorado, but here's what makes sportsbetting.com a no-brainer for sports fans just like you. First of all, sharp odds and low juice. They have in-house bookmakers. They're not a third-party provider. They have reduced juice and the best prices you'll find out there on the market. Hassle-free bonuses with a one-time rollover. That means the bonus money is yours after you bet it one time, whereas other sites range from five to 30 times. Also, 24-7 live customer support. That means when you contact them, you're always getting a real person in the U.S., never a robot, always a real live human being. But here's the kicker. At sportsbetting.com, you get a 100% risk-free week of sports betting up to $1,000. Not just one bet, but all of your bets. Play for a week, and if your losses exceed your winnings at the end of the week, sportsbetting.com will cover 100% of the difference up to uh, $1,000 with a one-time rollover. So again, head on over to sportsbetting.com slash milehighhuddle. That's sportsbetting.com slash milehighhuddle and capitalize on a risk-free week of sports betting up to $1,000. Dollar dollar bills. As always, guys, follow the mothership account for the Huddle Up Pod at Huddle Up Pod. Also, be sure to follow Chad on Twitter at Chad and Jensen. Be sure to follow myself, as you can see on the screen, at Kelberman NFL. Also, as always, we ask you at Mile I Huddle as well. Follow the uh, the main account. And as always, Chad, we always ask our audience get your sw- swag on swag swag whatever at HuddleUpPod.com. You can get a hoodie, which I'm wearing right now. I'm wearing the 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 uh, football priest. 
Yes, hat, cap. I can't think of the word right now. You're wearing the trucker hat. You see the uh, mug behind me. Lots of swag out there. Lots of merchandise. Go and get you one if you are so inclined. And also, we always ask you if you're so inclined as well, facebook.com slash mile high huddle. Uh, become a supporter of the page, and uh, we would appreciate it. But, Chad, we always ask the audience, no matter what you do, it's free, it's easy, it takes two seconds, subscribe, like, and share. Helps us out. Like every video you see, share it out there. Help us become a bigger and better pod so we can reach new like-minded listeners just like you. This is the Overtime Podcast Network. Broncos country, that was rough, but we got something here to brighten your day. Coors Hard Seltzer is not your average seltzer. Rooted in Coors' long history of sustainability is a brand inspired by a generation that wants to do good in the world with a mission to restore America's rivers. Never before has it been so easy to make a difference, to make an impact. Coors Hard Seltzer is launching the world's easiest volunteer program. Whatever you're doing, by simply cracking open a can of Coors Hard Seltzer, you're volunteering because our waterways are at risk. 80% of America's rivers are drying up. Through a partnership with Change the Course, Coors Hard Seltzer is helping to protect and restore America's rivers. Each 12-pack of Coors Hard Seltzer restores 500 gallons of fresh water to U.S. rivers and the communities that depend on them. The results? 1 billion, that's with a B, you guys, gallons of water restored to 16 river basins across the U.S., including the Colorado River. And that's just year one. You get four refreshing flavors, one cool cause. Enjoy naturally flavored black cherry, mango, lemon lime, and grapefruit. And the specs are in, gang. Coarse Hard Seltzer is 4.5% ABV and only 90 calories. Chad, after the NFL did the Broncos dirty against the Saints, I'm so happy I have my black cherry Coors Hard Seltzer to lean back on. It's my favorite flavor. It always lightens my mood. It's the crisp, refreshing taste that I look for, and I'm so happy to have it on this football Sunday. Amen. So join the world's easiest volunteer program. By simply drinking Coors Hard Seltzer, you can volunteer to restore America's rivers. You buy Coors Hard Seltzer, you help restore 500 gallons of water into America's rivers. It is that simple. Visit CoorsSeltzer.com to find a Coors Hard Seltzer near you. That's CoorsSeltzer.com. For every 12-pack sold through 831-2021, Coors will purchase services from Change the Course to restore 500 gallons of fresh river water. Details at CoorsSeltzer.com. Celebrate responsibly. Coors Brewing Company, Fort Worth, Texas. Well done, my dog. Uh, Dave, appreciate you, my friend. Good to see you. Thanks. Zach, there, there's a bunch of different uh, topics we need to get to, but I want to just answer this from the Flute Guy Games. He's been patiently waiting. He says, do you guys think we should have brought Demarius back for one more year, especially when we had the issues with the receiver injury. Zach, my my answer to this, if you could get the Demarius Thomas of even 2015 or 2016, then yeah. But that those that, that ship sailed a long time ago. Why do we keep getting this question? I mean, you guys have seen the emergence of some young receivers, including Tim Patrick. You saw KJ Hamler, Jerry Judy's come on this year. Noah Fant, that would not have happened if you had Demarius Thomas out there. Like Chad mentioned, the new version of Demarius Thomas, not the old one. Your guys are living on a memory. He's not that anymore. He's a broken down shell of his former self. As always, I don't want an old vet taking snaps away from a young player. So I'm very happy they didn't pursue a reunion with him. John, do you have Dave from Georgia's super chat that you can throw up? There he is. In all his glory, we really appreciate you, Dave, and all your support. It means the world to us, my friend. He says, if the NFL is going to screw the Broncos this way, why not, why not just play second and third stringers? Why risk more of our best players for this year? Well, because, you know, look, last year, last week, the the Saints game was kind of the, the death knell in, in my opinion. I mean, they really had, had dug their own grave by losing in uh, Atlanta and, and uh, Vegas in back-to-back weeks. But that was a, the, the NFL strong arming the Broncos to all but forfeit the Saints game and handing them their seventh loss, considering the remaining schedule, Zach. I mean, that's the death knell. There's the odds of the Denver Broncos. I mean, even if they go into this week and, and shock the world and beat the Chiefs, you know, there's, this is not a season that's going to end up with, with January football, you know, yeah. uh, so to speak. So I understand why you say that, but that's not how the NFL thinks, Dave. The NFL – you play your best players, and that's that's just the way it is. There's pride at stake. There's film right. at stake. There's integrity of the game at right. stake. Even though the NFL missed that memo last week, as far as the integrity <laughs> of the game, that the Broncos, you know, they're they're going to get their money's worth of these guys that they're paying. 
That Yeah, there's professionalism at stake as well. And the Broncos are a first-class organization. Say what you want about them. They're not going to stoop to what the, the level that the NFL went to by not allowing them to field a quarterback and then moving the Ravens game three times in the week. Did you see, Chad, on, on Roger Goodell's halftime interview today, his weak explanation for why they moved the game? He said, except for a medical issue, we're going to play the game no matter what. And it's just so it's such a double standard, so hypocritical of him. But they're going to still play their first stringers because they have to pay those guys as well. Part of the reason they didn't forfeit is because they wanted the players to get a game check. There's a lot at stake beyond just getting back at the NFL. Uh, something like that is a good fantasy. It's a good revenge fantasy. It's not practical in reality. Guys, we got to also bring up before we get back to the stream and, and the super chats and <clears throat> the topics that are on your mind. I see David, he's, he's onto this topic here about Beth Bowman Wallace. We're going to, we're going to dive into that right now. Now, this is about as big as I can make it because the way this, this tweet from Troy Rank of Denver 7 uh, lays it out there. It's a bunch of little different uh, pictures. So just bear with me here while I read this. <clears throat> but you know the old phrase, Zach, kick them while they're down, right? The Broncos, man, they're down right now. After uh, lo- not only losing to the Saints, but the way they were treated by the NFL. And it, what's so frustrating about it or ironic or tragic, I mean, pick your word, is that the Broncos, unfortunately, have no one to blame but themselves over what happened Sunday, even though – we we all, at least you and I, we agree that the NFL, it was unfair. It was a double standard. There should have been nothing to preclude them from rescheduling this game for Tuesday night. At the end of the day, it's like the, the analogy we used a couple of days ago. The, you know, the little kid got caught on video stealing that Laffy Taffy. He was guilty. Doesn't make what the judge did right, handing out capital punishment, but the kid was guilty. And in the case of the Broncos, they had no one to, to blame but themselves over the predicament they found themselves in coming out of this last week. And so this was an opportunity for Beth Bolin Wallace and her sister, Amy, and as well as uh, the late Pat Bolin, his brother, John, to kind of throw some, some barbs in there while the Broncos are down, releasing a statement on Wednesday that just nukes the Broncos from orbit, the current uh, regime. And this is Joe Ellis. This is John Elway. This is the Pat Bolin trust. This is the against the, the trust. Joe Ellis, and then ultimately as well, John Elway. But here is the statement that was released. <clears throat> quote, this is from Beth Bowen Wallace. Quote, my sister, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> my sister Amy, my uncle John Bowen, and I have had the privilege, along with all fans that bleed orange and blue, of seeing what a winning team looks like. Watching these past few seasons has been extremely painful, and we continue to see no other way to restore the franchise for our fans but through a transition of ownership of the Denver Broncos. My father, Pat Bowen, would never have accepted the team's current state. Uh, Let me jump back up here. Uh, Fortunately, my father's legacy as one of the NFL's great owners has been solidified at the Pro Football Hall of Fame in Canton. We will forever reflect on the over 30 years, this this thing is so janky, uh, of ownership that got him there with great pride. Our desire is for this team to be restored to its winning ways and to see more Super Bowl championships for Broncos country. We have been committed to and will continue to pursue resolutions on all issues in order to ensure a smooth and timely transition. Um, whoop, dang it, this thing is so weird. All right, uh, we, I think this is the, yeah, we are hopeful that the, gosh dang it, we are hopeful that the <laughs> current leadership agrees. I'm going to try and do this. He's a, uh, that is in the best interest of the Denver Broncos. Most importantly, it is in the best interest of our incredibly loyal fans, my father's Lexi and the Bolin family, close quote. So, Zach, I got a lot of questions on Twitter today about this. What was your interpretation of this statement and the timing thereof? Well, as we talked about a, a few times in the last week, the NFL kind of nudged, forcibly nudged the Broncos along saying, listen, guys, if you don't wrap this up quickly in-house, we're going to make you take it out of house and maybe the Broncos know, or maybe there's been back channel or private discussions from outside competitors like Robert Smith or Jeff Bezos or another billionaire who wants the Broncos. It seems like they're trying to get in front of some story. And what, what that story is, we do not know just yet, but they're jockeying, Chad. I think everyone involved in the family wants to stay in the family, if only for financial reasons, personal reasons, you know, pride reasons. They don't want to have to sell out a house. And I think this was their way of answering back at the NFL for what they may or may not have told them behind the scenes. The thing is, what can this, what could this statement achieve? All right. Um, you know, what's, 
who benefits from this and what can you achieve? The court case right now that is being litigated by Beth Bowen, her sister Amy, and John Bowen against the Pat Bowen Trust has been pushed back to July, I believe, of 2021. All right, so the whole premise that they're of of the of Beth Bowen and her sister Amy and John that Pat wasn't in the right state of mind when he when he executed this trust and thus it should revert back to its previous state and all that. No, that cannot be adjudicated, resolved until July at the soonest. And it's probably still going to roll well into the fall of 2021. Yeah. And so why make this statement now just to create pressure? Here's, here's why. She wants to create pressure. This is a strategic move, in my opinion. This is my read on it. Uh, they feel the upswell of momentum, negative momentum, fan apathy, disillusion, outright anger and disgust over what happened last week. And they want to capitalize on that as a means in which to put more pressure on Ellis. And you know what they say about a certain substance that rolls downhill and then on to John Elway. And, you know, maybe it, I don't know what that could really accomplish, to be frank with you, between now and July. Maybe in a perfect world, they're hoping that a fan, um, this is just me spitballing, but some kind of a fan and media out, outcry would lead to Joe Ellis resigning or John Elway resigning at the end of the year. That's not going to happen, Zach. No, and um, I'm not totally sure either. I think your read is probably more correct than mine, and I think you have the right uh, mindset to it. You have to look at the timing of when this statement was put out because it was very detailed and very manicured. This wasn't just from the cuff. This wasn't just from someone's head at a last moment. Uh, this was made with a strategic, like you said, uh, advancement in mind. You have to wonder, though, what's the latest Broncos news cycle? Uh, they've been screwed over by the NFL with their quarterbacks. They signed Garrett Bowles to a big contract. It's been a mostly positive Broncos news cycle, the loss aside. So throwing it out there on top of that, it might be some sort of strategy with that as well. I- I'm not totally sure. This is the Overtime Podcast Network. It's just, to be frank with you, you know, they're all big boys, but this is the last thing the Broncos need. I am sure that Elway, Ellis, Fangio right now, they're livid, to be frank with you. Um, Muhammad jumping in with a super stick. I really appreciate that, my friend. He says, hey, you. Good to see you, my my hey. uh, my dog. And looking good. There's the MHH male model rocking the, the swag for us there. Uh, Kenneth has a very interesting super chat. And, of course, we appreciate the support, as always. Kenneth, one of our superstars in the MHH community and up there on the MHH Mount Rushmore. Question for the offseason. Sign one, fire one, trade one, go. I'm thinking of Step Brothers, right, that scene? <laughs> uh, I, I can't repeat what he actually sure. says in that scene, but it reminds me of that. So who, if you sign someone outside the building, who are you signing? Or maybe even a free agent of Broncos on. Who are you firing? Who are you trading? Well, I'm firing Tom McMahon at a minimum. I'm probably, I don't know about Pat Shermer yet, but definitely firing McMahon, uh, keeping Fangio, trading one. It's not going to be Von Miller. I, I would say maybe maybe Melvin Gordon, maybe Kareem Jackson. I would maybe want to unload a big contract to, to sign. In terms of free agents, I'd have to see the, the list, Chad, in front of me, like who's a free agent next year. In terms of quarterbacks, I mean, I would love Dak Prescott if Drew Locke's not the guy. But in terms of in-house guys, I want Shelby Harris signed. I want Philip Lindsay signed. I wouldn't mind Justin Simmons getting the franchise tag, but the fire one's always the most, uh, the fun one to answer. So definitely Tom McMahon for me. Yeah, I would say uh, McMahon probably at the top of the list there, <clears throat> but I'm not going to rule out the idea that if this season really does go off the rails and I mean, if this next week is an embarrassing loss to the chiefs and I mean, look at the remaining schedule, guys. There's no, I mean, there is no gimme game on the remaining schedule with the exception of maybe Carolina. But even that, you're on the East Coast, all bets are off, road game. Um, I'm not ruling out the possibility of John Elway not necessarily firing himself and stepping down from his involvement with the Broncos, but just saying, hey, look, I recognize that uh, maybe I need, we need a different vision and voice on the personnel sure. side. I'm going to remain president of football operations, but I'm passing the duties on of GM and day-to-day personnel and management of the team per se to a, to a general manager. We're going to go out and make a hire. I don't expect that to happen. I'm just saying if this continues to swell off the, off the rail, so to speak, Zach, I just don't know how Elway, I mean, right now I'm trying to imagine what that end of season press conference is going to look like in the, in, in the wake of all this and what the talking points on the part of, Broncos propaganda is going to be if you're John Elway, but I just can't imagine him standing up there for a fifth straight season, right? 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. 
and saying, we're not just falling short by a hair, right? We're like still many games away from being competitive. And again, a lot of mulligans, a lot, you know, a lot of um, factors that you could point to to say mulligan. But but after four years of this, people don't really want to hear it, as true as it might be. Seriously, like I'll I'll stand up with John Elway right now and say, this was a this should be a mulligan year for everybody involved. However, it's not what people want to hear because of the preceding four years, Zach, and the one common denominator through all those years, Elway. Yep. Uh, one thing for sure that press conference is going to be held through masks for, you know, they're going to be well on their P's and Q's and be with their face gear and the distancing and uh, they're not going to want to risk that. And that's going to be a theme, I think, for Elway going up there. And he's going to talk about the pandemic. He's going to talk about the challenges, if only to exonerate himself. And Chad, it's a great theory and it would be a bombshell story. And it'd be great for us in business if that happened. I just can't see Elway's ego. I can't see him getting up there and taking the fall. And, and stabbing himself in the chest, you know, and, and turning on himself and his own beliefs. He would rather scapegoat another coach or a quarterback or whatever before he blames himself. I, I think he'd have to be dragged out of the building, kicking and screaming for him to be losing that GM title. If they were to win a playoff game or a Super Bowl or he had the quarterback, he would rather go off on the sunset on a good note like Peyton. He wouldn't want to go off on a bad note and become Tom Brady where he's trying to hang on and, and his reputation gets tarnished unnecessarily. So I can't see Elway stepping down, but stranger things have happened though. I'll say that. Yeah. I mean, he's, he's always been able to come and go on his own terms. Right. I mean, by virtue of his rare talent as a player back in the day and even coming in here to take over um, football operations in the wake of the Josh McDaniels era, he's always kind of been able to, to set his own terms and it reaches a certain point though, sometimes where you, you know, if the, if the, it's a production based business and if the production isn't there, you know, you all bets are off. All right, David wants to know on Facebook. I've been a Demarcus Walker fan, but do you think he's going? Uh, he's doing enough for another contract, even if as a backup. Zach, I definitely think the Broncos would, with how he produces uh, as a pass rusher, I think the Broncos would definitely, in a perfect world, like to keep him around as a as a depth guy. But when he hits free agency this year, he's going to have teams willing to pay him a little m- money, and it's going to be it might be a little money relative to pass rushers but it's going to be a lot of money compared to what the Broncos are going to be willing to pay. You know, I can see the Cardinals coming in and offering him a solid two-year deal to come rush the passer as an interior guy who's just hitting his prime. The Broncos, though, I mean, they've already thrown in with Draymond. They just drafted McTelvin Ajim. They have – we'll see what happens with Shelby. They're, they have a big contract with Jarrell Casey. We'll see what happens with that. But who knows? That could change between now and then, but that's just me reading the tea leaves. It's a lot like the Will Park situation. They they would prefer to keep him around as a backup, but they don't want to pay him a market value backup contract. And a team like you mentioned, the Cardinals, a team like the Niners with Kyle Shanahan, they've uh, developed defensive linemen, a team like the the Colts or the Ravens who've known to snatch up the Broncos' leftovers with Devontae Harris and Derek Wolf. Um, I, I can definitely see Demarcus Walker lending a contract, but we mentioned this on the last pod, or at least I did. Would you want to come back and play for Fangio if he's the coach next year, considering how Fangio, what he said about him? He had two stacks in the game. He's getting on him for the run uh, defense and the touchdown they let up. I, if I was Demarcus Walker, I've been in the doghouse for two coaching staffs now. I would want to expand and see what else is out there and get in the playing time that I would think I deserve. Jeff C., one of our superstars, jumping in. Appreciate you, my friend. He says, uh, the team will end up out of the Bowen family's hands. The team needs a voice, vigor, vision, and cash. Hey, you might you might be. I'm thinking that you are a big fan of the movie V for Vendetta. This is that's just me guessing the the monologue at the very beginning, and cash to guide the team back to the top of the mountain. Yeah, I'm, I mean, I'm at a point now where I am very disillusioned in terms of, you know, I know Pat wanted it to stay in the family. And he had a plan in place to try and groom and select the right kid to keep it in the family. But Zach, when no one can get on the same page, there's not unity within the family. And understandably so, because you've got two different families, three really, uh, within one. Because we, we learned, I can't remember her name now, it escapes me, but we learned that there was also a, an additional Bowen daughter of Pat's from a, from a uh, I don't know, side thing. Anyway, but you've got two <laughs> marriages. Let me just keep it with the marriages. And the two, the two marriages, the first wife, that came, uh, Beth and Amy came from the, his first wife. And then all the other five kids uh, came from Annabelle, who also released a statement. We can get to that here in a minute. Um, and so, you know, it's not 
but honestly, Zach, to be frank with you, even if these were all children of the same mother and father, I think you would still see the bickering. Like the five that are from Annabelle don't seem to necessarily be on the same page. At least what's his name? Johnny. He doesn't seem to be too stoked on the idea that Brittany's, you know, the, the preferred choice within his little, his little clan. So I don't know. I'm at a point though, where, you know, change, something needs to change. And it's probably though just setting expectations. Zach, again, I want to remind everybody, people don't fire themselves in the world, let alone in the NFL. Elway's under contract through 2021, which is also going to coincide probably with the resolution of this suit um, that's in court. So I'm guessing that this is the status quo through 2021, which gives Elway and Fangio and probably Drew Locke one last hurrah to see if they can turn the ship around. Yeah, good old Johnny. What do you call himself? The blood of Denver? The blood of the city? I mean, that's, uh, that's a great guy right there. He was uh, Vance's best friend. You know, I don't really subscribe to the notion that the Broncos were bad this year because of ownership or they've they've lost games because of a lack of ownership. The lack of ownership definitely played a part in the NFL screwing them over. If Pat Bowen was presiding over the team, that would not have happened. At least I believe that. But if the injuries didn't strike, if there wasn't a pandemic, this team was primed to win games this year, Chad. With an owner, without an owner, I don't put the onus on Elway for that or, or for the Broncos on that. It needs to get situated. Needs to, now something needs to change, like you said. It's pointing toward it going out of house right now, but none of those kids who are all inheritance of the estate and all inheritance of the team, they all want their hands in the cookie jar. You don't want the cookie jar closed in front of you and given to someone else. So they're going to keep reaching in there and trying to get that cookie until someone, an arbiter, someone steps in and says, you know what? These cookies are going to somebody else. Too bad. This is the Overtime Podcast Network. And you know what? They all stand to make a couple hundred million bucks but from the sale of this team. So it's not like if this team does get sold, <laughs> they, uh, you know, don't cry him too many crocodile tears. The flute guy jumping in again. Appreciate you, my friend. Uh, been watching for a while. Hashtag Denver Broncos for life. Appreciate you. My only hope is that we make these last five games interesting and close. My one dream, though, get Kendall Hinton a touchdown before the end of the year. Won't happen, but that would be cool. I thought it was it was uh, interesting, Zach, what, uh, what Drew Locke had to say today about Kendall Hinton in terms of he was asked, Hey, you know, before Kendall took the field on Sunday, did you get a chance to talk to him, give him any tips, any pointers? And to paraphrase Drew, he was like, look, you know, at that point, he was already cramming. He had a million people in his ear trying to tell him, trying to get him ready for that game. The last thing he needed was a, another voice. But then he went on to recount a, a, an encounter with Hinton in the parking lot on Monday morning as he came in to get his test, right, did uh, did lock, and then Kendall, uh, Hinton coming in to report and whatnot. Here's what he said. Uh, I'm going to read this quote. Um, He went out there, played his butt. What else can you ask this guy to do? He went out there, played his butt off. I saw him the next morning when I'm sitting in my car waiting to get my rapid test results back that were negative. He made sure Zach did that were negative. That's obviously sticking in his craw. He got out of the car. I kept my mask on, of course, and said, Kendall, man, I'm so proud of you for, for going out there. It takes a lot of guts and a lot of heart to go out there and do what you did in the circumstances that you did. He said, much respect for what you guys do now, of course. But I j- just was really proud of him to be able to go out there and, and try to lead the team against such a good defense. He showed a lot of heart, and he gained the respect of pretty much this whole team. So, yeah, I mean, in a perfect world, it would be cool to, to throw him a bone. But uh, as you elucidate, flute guy there yourself, the NFL is not typically prone to sentimentality. You know, right. it's, uh, you know that's, it's probably not going to happen. They're not big on nostalgia and, and, you know, as well, they should be. It's a production based business and it's a business at that. And as good and admirable as Hinton was to play quarterback in that game, I said the Broncos should have kept him on the 53 as a, as a thank you to him, as a token of appreciation for what he did do. But you'd have to cut someone in that scenario. You're going to cut Spencer. You're going to cut uh, Tyree Cleveland to make room for a guy just because you want him to have a feel good story. It's great what he did here in my respect here in the respect of a lot of people, but going forward, that chapter now is closed, and the Broncos have to move forward. Our friend Tony from Discount Audio and Wheels, DA Dub in Los Angeles, jumping in. He says, who do you feel watching Wolf play today uh, is just a reminder of Elway's swing and miss. Casey made $12 million, played a game for us. Wolf signed for way cheaper. Don't get me started on that, Tony, because yeah. you know how I feel about Derek Wolf. Um yeah, Jarrell Casey, look, the 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 tragedy of the Jarrell Casey move was the Broncos got him for a song, right? They got a 
five, a, a five year in a row Pro Bowl defensive tackle for a seventh round pick. Yeah, they had to foot the bill in terms of absorbing that contract, but there was no reason to believe, per se, other than, you know, he was north of 30, that uh, he was going to end up walking into a buzzsaw and be, be lost after week two. But nevertheless, I still am a little sore that the Broncos didn't try harder to keep Derek Wolf around because not only is he an Elway guy, true blue. He's one of only five Elway draft picks to garner a second contract with the team, sacrificed, all that stuff. But, Zach, all signs pointed to him being an ideal fit for the Vic Fangio's uh, scheme. Let me remind you, he was leading the team in sacks at week 13 when he went down with that injury that cost him the rest of the year. More than Vaughn, more than anyone else on the, on the roster, including Shelby, he was proving to be an excellent fit for Fangio. So I'm always going to wonder what could have been, but uh, – you know, I'm I'm very I'm very sentimental when it comes to Derek Wolf. He was always one of my favorite Broncos to cover. It's so weird this question popped up today. I was watching the Ravens game and thinking and what travesty of the game that was. Don't even get me started on that. But I was watching Wolf play and I'm thinking to myself, he's still really good against the run, but he really doesn't offer much as a pass rusher anymore. And I think the Broncos, I know how you feel, Chad. The Broncos made the right move moving on from Derek Wolf, sentimentality aside, and bringing back Shelby Harris on a one year prove it deal. And before Shelby Harris went on the CV list, he was performing at a very high level this year. In terms of Jarrell Casey, I literally cannot knock Elway at all for that. I I was praising him and lauding him for that move to get a five-time Pro Bowler, taking on that contract, which is not cap-killing because you can get out of it this offseason, all cap savings, no dead money. It was a win-win scenario for Elway. It didn't work out. Sometimes it doesn't. Be happy they can move on, get out of it, and use that money to a player like Justin Simmons, uh, Shelby Harris, Phillip Lindsay. There's good with a lot of bad to come out of it. Uh, we got a question here from Zeus McPeak. Love you, buddy. Good to see you. Uh, MHH Mount Rushmore, we call him Zeus, up in here. He says, hi, all. So what choices do we have for a new special teams coach? That's got to be a very high priority. We would think so, um, but I'm not going to lie to you, Stu, and, and pretend to know the name of every um, <laughs> every uh, eligible special teams coach in the league that might be considered for the gig. I really don't know. I'm not, you know, I'll be honest with you. I can name probably half a dozen special teams coordinators if put on the spot right now, but they all have jobs. Uh, Do you have someone's? I I agree, though, Stu, that it's it's got to be a priority to upgrade that if you can. If you're Vic Fangio, someone's out there that you feel like can come in and and at least turn that over a little bit. But what are your thoughts, Zach? Well, as an aside, I was watching the Ravens, and of course they have Devontae Harris now, and he made a big special teams play by forcing a fumble. And I'm thinking to myself, he's playing for John Harbaugh, one of the best special teams coaches in the business. You just see the level of coaching difference and what that can do for a player. I don't know many uh, candidates out there for special teams. I know that uh, the Broncos like Dave Taub. They interviewed him in 2017, and you know every year his unit is, is among the best, if not the best in the NFL. They would have been okay with his hiring. Someone from that tree, someone from Baltimore, maybe someone from the Giants with Joe Judge. He was a special teams guy. I don't know many candidates, though, but Tom McMahon has to go. That is priority number one this offseason. George wants to know, do you think if Elway can that he'll draft BYU quarterback Zach Wilson? You know, it just depends on there's still so many factors that are floating around out there. Um Right before, it's so bizarre, the day that that Drew Locke dropped his guard, came in on his own volition, rallied the other quarterbacks. Hey, guys, I I know Tuesday's our day off, but you guys want to meet me at the facility? Let's watch some film. Yeah, Drew, let's do it. Drop the the mask, whatever, right? Turns out that same day, John Elway gives a, uh, unbeknownst to him, of course, that that was happening. He gives an interview to Broncos TV saying, I am excited about Drew. Yeah, we, we wish he could be more consistent. Um, but everything he's going through right now is only going to help him in the future. Zach, it was just the tonality and the content of what he said was nothing but unwavering belief and support in Drew Locke. Then that happened. You got to wonder how much it affected that. I, I mean, I don't know. But if the Broncos go on to, I mean, again, this I think this Chiefs game is kind of going to set the tone for the remainder of this year. If the Broncos go into this game and give him a fight and, he, and come up short, I think that that alone could give Locke and everybody the momentum they need to kind of cruise through the rest of this season and make it respectable and mollify Elway into going, all right, we're going to give Drew 2021 and double down and build the nest again and, and really just focus on making 2021 the best we can. But if it goes off the rails in these remaining weeks after what just happened last week in terms of the you know leadership crisis, I don't want to make too much of it, but 
all the questions now that permeate around Drew Locke that are on the intangible side. There's already the tangible questions, right, with the injury, is he injury prone, inconsistency, regression in his technique, all that stuff. But now you've got intangible questions about his leadership, about his uh, maturity, about his wherewithal, all that stuff. Then I could see him going and saying, well, we got we to make an upgrade. And if you want Zach Wilson, though, Zach, it's probably going to be you got to have a top 10 pick and they're cruising for a top 10 pick. So, well, I don't I'm not going to pr- predict that at this stage, but I think right now it's at least on the table. Maybe it's just me, though, and I look at it differently and I, I am a lock supporter. But what he did answers questions about his leadership ability and doesn't raise questions about it. I like that he wanted a film session. I like that he rallied his teammates. I'm not going to fault him for dropping his mask. And if Elway's judging Drew Locke or calling into question what he can do as a quarterback of this team based on this incident, I wouldn't even call it a crisis. It's a situation which the Broncos were put through. I think this was commendable by Drew Locke. And, you know, he's a young kid. He's a young guy. He's trying to establish himself as a leader and get ahead of, of everybody else and make it clear cut that the Broncos shouldn't believe in him. He had a film session. He wasn't out partying. He wasn't at a bar. He didn't get a DUI like Melvin Gordon. So I'm not killing Drew Locke for that. Elway has to judge Locke on his on-field play or lack thereof, uh, on his performances and his effort, or lack thereof. If he's not the guy, great, but judge him based on that and come to a conclusion based on what he does on the field, not because he dropped his mask while eating and he went around Jeff Driscoll and uh, he wasn't even positive. So I can't even say he was positive for that. I'm not going to kill him. I'm not. That's my outlook as well. I mean, I'm just telling you some of the questions, right, that are out there now on Drew Locke. I think Elway's more inclined. You know, if you could be a fly on the wall listening to those conversations – I would bet money if I could be one of those flies that what I would hear from John Elway right now, privately behind closed doors would match basically what you just said. Uh, Poppy jumping in. We love you, Poppy. One of our superstars. She has earned the moniker, the princess of MHH. And we love you. It's good to see you. and appreciate your generosity as always. She says, just want to say hello to everyone. I'm at work and I miss chatting with you all. Go Broncos. We appreciate you. And thanks for, for popping in saying hi and brightening our day. Yeah, hope all is well, Bobby. Thank you so much. Um, we got a few very patient superstars that uh, we want to grab here, including Smouse in the house, Zachary, a.k.a. Z-Dub Designs. Everyone knows Zachary. We had him on the show during the off season. We'll get him on the show again uh, once the, the dust settles on this season. But uh, the, the brainchild behind the Mile High Huddle, let them hate shirt, as you can see him rocking in this awesome YouTube profile pic, and this is a cat that inspires me, Zach. He tagged me on on Facebook a, a week or so back on some push up challenge, and I'm like, he's doing it. Like he's doing the push ups himself. I'm like, I would love to do it, but I'm just these Facebook challenges. You get tagged and stuff on Facebook. I just suck at following through on those because I got I'm spinning so many plates. But Zachary, suffice to say, my friend, you are you you inspire us, and and we do appreciate your spot and and place in this community. He says, sorry for being MIA lately. I just have been learning a lot. By the way, in my opinion, after Sunday, I really appreciate Locke being our QB. He's young, needs time to grow, but he does have the mentality to grow. And I think that's true, Zachary. And and Zach, Elway seems to incline to agree on that uh, based on what he said last week, as I mentioned before, before all the crap, the drama, the NFL overplayed that. Let's face it. But nevertheless, again, it's the kid that got caught on camera still in the Laffy Taffy. You can't d- debate that he got caught, right? He got busted. But it's it's a small thing. It's a negligible crime. Yeah, and I never really answered the last question, so my apologies for that. If you held a gun to my head right now, I'm saying Locke is the quarterback going into 2021. In terms of Zach Wilson, like you said, they're not going to be within range more than likely of him, and they'd have to trade up. I just don't think they make that move. They'll bring in someone, maybe a mid-round quarterback or maybe a better veteran free agent like a Ryan Fitzpatrick. But I think they're going to give him and kind of tilt the, the the field in his favor for him going into the uh, next season being the starting quarterback. Is anything going to be handed to him? No. Is he going to be grandfathered in? No. But he's going to give be given every opportunity to win that job. Christian jumping in, one of our superstars. Good to see you, my friend. He said, and appreciate you as always. He says, if the Broncos do indeed sell the team, do you think that Robert Smith would be the odds on favorite to buy the team? Probably. It seems like he's the leader in the clubhouse, Zach, at this stage. But that's yeah. still many uh, moves on the checkers uh, on the board, you know, down the road. I don't see Bezos being a I, – I, maybe I'm wrong. I just don't see him being the guy to buy the Broncos. I don't think he'd want to plunk down money in a franchise like Denver. But, you know, I think Smith is the guy on the outside. 
Um, I'm going to grab this question here from JT across the pond. Where'd it go? That applied to, we got to, we got to come full circle on and cover every angle of this Beth Bolin Wallace, Amy uh, Bolin and the Pat Bolin trust. He says, have you seen Annabelle Bolin's response through her people? Clearly this is going to get messy and bad. Yes. Let's cover it now. So everyone is clued in here. It already has gotten messy for what it's worth. JT. Um, it's just a, it's just a question of magnitude. How, how messy can it get? How bad can it get? Uh, but this is from Mike Kliss. They, of course, the statement comes through Mike Kliss from Annabelle Bolin. Quote, Miss Wallace does not represent my client's views. This is her attorney, um, Hugh Gotts- Gottschalk. Gottschalk. Quote, Miss Wallace does not represent Annabelle Bolin's views or the views of the majority of the beneficiaries. And uh, moreover, Miss Wallace has fl- filed a lawsuit that alleges that Mr. Bolin lacked the capacity to execute uh, execute the estate planning documents and appointed the trustees and that the trustees therefore have no authority. Wow. Although we strongly disagree with these allegations and believe the estate plan will be upheld at the trial scheduled for July, 2021, any efforts to consider selling the team before the trustees authority is confirmed is unwise and more efforts to even consider selling the team before the trustees authority is confirmed is unwise and impractical and would be contrary to Pat Bowen's wishes to have the Bowen family continue to own the Broncos if one of his children develops the ability to take over the role of controlling owner. So that's, you know, obviously when I said, what are, what are you trying to accomplish? I th- honestly do believe her first mission, uh, Beth Bowen Wallace and Amy was to just put more pressure on Elway and Ellis and the whole brain trust basically while there's this negative momentum focused on the Broncos. But why would she all of a sudden want them to sell the team when she's fighting to get ownership of the team herself? That's the one thing I don't, doesn't quite line up for me, but reading between the lines of what she said in her statement, it does come off that that's what she's advocating uh, in a general sense. I don't want to get hit with a defamation suit, so I'll keep my comments fairly, you know, fairly nice. I don't really trust the vibe she's kind of putting off, Chad, or the, the, the tenor of the conversation and the statement that she made. I just think she's a little, how do I say it? I don't know, a little more backhanded or a little more conniving than Brittany is. I think Brittany has the Broncos' best interest in mind, and I think Beth Boland Wallace has Beth Boland Wallace's best interest in mind. So, you know, if you had to ask me my personal favorite, I think Brittany would be the safer choice. There's just something that's not sitting right about that statement to me, Chad. I agree. It just comes off as very self-serving. Yes. And if you really cared about – this is just me, you know, spitting here. But if you really cared about your father's legacy and the team and all that, why would you want to kick it while it's down? You know, why wouldn't you want to try and – you know, even if you have a, a bad word to say about everybody – why would you do it and drag your, you know, play a part in dragging your father's team, thus his legacy, yeah. through the mud? I do question that. I think that's a great observation you make, Zach. She does come off as a lot more conniving is a good word for it. I mean, this is just us <laughs> reading what she, her own statements and maneuvers in the court of, in, in in public scrutiny. Jerry and uh, multiple Facebook supporters, including Albert, want to know about the Broncos finding the quarterbacks. Yes, they did find the quarterbacks. <clears throat> Drew Locke, Brett Rippon, Blake Bortles. Drew Locke was asked today, hey, what did, uh, you know, on Monday, of course, Vic Fangio, and we, we talked about this Monday night, said that he was disappointed in the, in, the, in the quarterbacks without saying word one about anything, how the NFL handled that whole situation. Refused to comment on the NFL, but was quick to say how disappointed he was in Drew and the quarterbacks and all that. And so after being fined today, no doubt Drew, uh, Drew, when he took the podium, the virtual podium today, was aware that he was getting fined or that he had been fined. He was asked, hey, were, have, were you upset at all by Vicks saying he was disappointed in the quarterbacks? Zach, here is his reply. Quote, no, anything that Coach Vicks says, it's not in my opportunity or my jurisdiction to really get upset with him. He's my boss. He's the leader of this team. And whatever he says goes. I feel like we're taking a little bit of leadership by coming in and getting ready by ourselves, talking about that day, Hmm. and doing that by ourselves on a day where everyone else is at home. So I feel like that shows leadership. But again, we didn't do the right thing. We didn't have them on talking about the mask the whole time we were in there. That's just the point of the matter is they felt it was off for the amount of time to be able to keep us out of the game. That's what it is, and we've got to be better, close quote. So Wow. 
you know, he's my boss. What do you want me to do? Um, what he says goes, it is what it is. I love that answer. He's pretty much also defending himself and kind of the the point I was making. It's like, listen, guys, it's me demonstrating my leadership and me showing I want to take the reins and be a mentor for the other quarterbacks and be a leader for the other quarterbacks. I love this response. He didn't insult Fangio. He didn't step on toes. He was respectful, and he made valid points. He can't control what Fangio does. He can't control what Fangio says or thinks. He can only do what he does, but he defended his own actions and his own uh, point of view, and I, I respect that and I appreciate that. John, after we grab base gaze here, do you have Mark Langley's super? If so, um, let's get him on next. Base gaze wants to know and appreciate the super. It's good to see you, my friend. What are your thoughts on Justin Simmons now after his recent play? And do you think he'll get tagged next season? I think we've priced ourselves out. Um, my opinion on on Simmons has evolved. The first quarter of this season, as you guys know, I was very disappointed in his play. I felt like he played at a at or below replacement level safety, but he's really turned it around. The last six games or so, I'll say, he's been very, very good. And I think he's he's inched much closer to mollifying any concerns, assuaging any concerns that Elway and company might have had in terms of was last year a fluke? Was last year's elite display a fluke for, for Justin Simmons? Now, that doesn't make it any easier, Zach, to find the money to pay him. Uh, but uh, he could very well end up getting tagged a second year. I mean, I don't put that – off the table at this stage. Uh, well, I think the two tag candidates in reality were Garrett Bowles and Justin Simmons. Obviously, Bowles got his long term contract, and Simmons, you know, he's he's up for that. And I, I'm just not sure. I want to. I'm looking at the contracts right now. I'm not sure I want to pay him. I mean, average per year for the highest paid safety in the NFL, Buda Baker is fourteen point seven five. I, I just I don't know the tag offhand, the 2021 uh, safety tag number, Chad, but I just 1475 or you'd have to go to 15 at minimum to go a little above market value. I'm just not that sure of him at that number. I'm not there yet. I'm maybe at 12 or 13, but 15 a year, maybe beyond that 16. He's been better the last couple of weeks, but he started bad, Chad. Certainly not what we saw last year. I think if you move on from Kareem Jackson <clears throat> after this season, it's a, it's a near – guarantee that Simmons gets a multi-year extension from the Broncos. But I think that's part of it is they, they were trying to strike while the iron was hot in terms of, Hey, let's just get him franchise tag. We think we got a shot this year. And then the injury bug struck, but how can you go into 2021 paying Kareem 12 million or 11 million, whatever he's on the cap for next year. And then also be expected to pay top dollar to Justin Simmons. When you got cornerback problems. Now you got to figure out what's going on at cornerback. Like you, you know, sometimes you can't have your cake and eat it too. So we'll see. I, I think the Broncos though, <clears throat> you know, just the blowback this team would get by letting Justin Simmons go would uh, is, is disincentive enough to allow it to happen. All right. Let's see from Mark Langley. Good to see you, my dog. This is a man I love. All right. This is a, this is a uh, long time listener, bona fide superstar. And we love you, Mark. He says, what's uh, what's up my guys. How well do you think Locke will do Sunday night's game against KC? What do you think his stat line will be? And yes, Zach, I know you don't care about stats, only the dub, hashtag MHH. Zach, um, stats, I mean, shoot, that's a shot in the dark in my opinion. But uh, I think right now, I mean, Drew's worst games as a pro have come against the Chiefs. Now, hopefully this isn't a snow game, and if it's not a snow game, it'll be the first game against the Chiefs he's played that isn't a snow game. But I'm more inclined to expect him to continue to struggle against this Chiefs team because of the emotional block. I mean, not only are they a juggernaut, right? Not only are they just as good as it gets in the league, but he seems to have some kind of an emotional block with them because of his being a native of Kansas City and growing up as a Chiefs fan and all that stuff, a true son of Missouri. That's still very much front of brain for Drew Locke. And until it's not, I do worry and wonder, you know, when I get a question like this from the community, that he's going to be able to overcome it. So it's a, I'm in a believe it when I see it type of, of mode with regard to Drew Locke playing well against the Chiefs, let alone beating the Chiefs. Well, you know, in our season predictions way back, and I think it was uh, August or early September, I actually had the Broncos splitting with Kansas City and beating Kansas City at Arrowhead in this game. It would be something if Drew Locke pulled that off. And I tweeted not that long ago, Chad, what's the best way for the Broncos to get back at the NFL is take down their golden child for all the world to see. And this should be the Broncos Super Bowl this Sunday. And I don't really say that too often. I don't put too much stock in one game. But the circumstances, Chad, getting screwed over, playing your hated rivals at their house on primetime television, you have nothing to lose. 
the stat line, though, for Drew Locke, it's going to come down to whether the Broncos win or whether the Broncos lose. If they lose, the game script can get way off hand. They could be trailing by 14, 21 points by the you know the third or fourth series. They're going to have to throw a lot. If that happens, Locke could put up garbage time stats. If they're competitive, though, they take the game in the fourth quarter, it'll be because why? The running game. Just like they won a couple weeks ago with their running game. That's how they have to do it. So you can have a smaller game. I don't think we're going to see a four interception game from Locke, but I don't think we're going to see a four touchdown game from Locke either. The same typical 250, two touchdowns and one pick, I think we'll see regardless. Casey Nickel jumping in with a super chat. Appreciate you, Casey. And Zach, as we approach the one hour mark here on a Wednesday night, we'll rapid fire through our remaining superstars before we dip on out. But Casey, really appreciate the support, my friend. He says, here come the Bezos Broncos. I'm done with LA. It's very obvious it is a pride issue over the health and wellness of the O. Uh, let me let me emphasize that differently. I'm done with LA. It's very obvious it is a pride issue over the health and wellness of the organization. And I think this is a sentiment that increasingly more and more fans uh, agree with in terms of just kind of being done with LA. And that's what that's what makes this season kind of as tragic as all the more tragic is. You know, I think Elway did put together a good team, but the football fates just wield something ungodly, you know, and uh, the, just the luck and all that. But eventually, you know, you can't just keep passing the buck. Eventually there has to be a consequence for year in and year out. Uh, I don't want to say ineptitude, but, you know, failing to meet the standard. Let me just put it that way. You know what? I, I I definitely agree with you. And you can certainly knock Elway for 2016, 2017, 2018, 2019, the post-Super Bowl years. That was on him for constructing the team, picking the quarterbacks, picking the head coaches. But I thought he did a damn good job this offseason assembling the coaching staff for the most part and assembling the roster specifically around Drew Locke. Getting the receivers, getting the running backs, getting the tight ends, getting the offensive line fixed. You have Fangio's defensive prowess. I thought Elway went all in in the right way. And the Broncos, pandemic aside, injuries aside, they should have been a 9 or 10 win team. His draft has been on point for the last three years. Elway has grown as a GM. And I agree, the overall picture, it all comes back to him. He is the guy. He is the lightning rod. But this season specifically is not on John Elway's shoulders. It is way more to me on the players and the coaches than it is the front office. Corey H. jumping in. Appreciate you, my friend. Good to see you. He says, Beth is a snake. Trust the trust. Brittany, <laughs> the word I wanted to use. <laughs> Brittany is the next owner. As for this season, the main thing is still the main thing. Figure out Locke. And if it's not him, maybe it's Ryan or Stafford. Talking about Matt Ryan or mm-hmm. Matthew Stafford. I shudder to think of turning it over to a Ryan or a Stafford and just more seasons of, you know, this team can't lull itself back into the false security of, we are one middle of the road quarterback away right. from winning it all. Right. You know, that was obviously a flawed philosophy that they paid the price for. That's honestly half the reason why these previous four years were as bad as they were. They thought that. Look at every year. Simeon in 16. Simeon again, plus Osweiler in 17. 18, it was Keen and middle. All, these are all middle of the road guys. And then last year with Flacco before they finally played their rookie lock. So if it's not lock, then go back to the draft. Don't go through these motions of bringing in, you know, a Stafford or a, or a Ryan. He might bring in a better veteran backup, like we mentioned, like a Ryan Fitzpatrick or, you know, like a Tyrod Taylor type. But Elway took a good look in the mirror of this offseason in the last year and saw it's a young man's business, at least at quarterback. It's a young quarterback's league. You don't win with veterans and has You win with developing your own guys. So he took a huge step in the right direction by giving that crown to Locke for this season. And if it's not Locke, it definitely has to be a young quarterback back i don't want stafford he's broken i don't want matt ryan he's broken i want my own guy from the jump from day one who i develop and he grows year by year by year and gets better i want the prime of the guy i don't want the back nine of the guy Naj jumping in good to see you my friend just so consistent means the world to us brother it really does so thank you it's good to see you he says brothers i get the ownership issues injuries the pandemic etc but ultimately This team leads the league in turnovers and is one of the worst at forcing them. Ultimately, is this on the coaches more or the players? You know, this goes back to what Zach just said. You know, this has been more of a, in terms of trying to make the most of a, of a season that was spoiled by injuries. This is where the coaches and players have really fallen short. And, 
you know, if you look at Fangio, his last two stops as a defensive coordinator, he was more he was able to more quickly hit the ground running <clears throat> in uh, San Francisco because the the horses were there. But in Chicago, man, it really took him four solid years to turn that ship around and get that defense remade in his image to where they not only were leading the league in sacks and the scoring defense, but they were taking the ball away uh, none better than the than the Fangio defense in Chicago. So tying that into this question here, Naj, it is an issue. But the one thing you got to keep in mind is in terms of the give uh, the, the takeaway giveaway ratio, four different quarterbacks this year have started games. Four. Injuries, the virus, the league, what do you expect? And Drew, you know, he injures his shoulder in week two. And that, I think, did interrupt what modest momentum and chemistry he'd built with Pat Shermer. So who's it on? It's I think it's more on, on the players, to be frank with you. But, you know, it's also on the coaches as well. But Vic Fangio, seriously, guys, what more do you expect this cat to do defensively than what they've done? Considering Vaughn, Jarrell, Purcell, Shelby gone for a month. Uh, let's keep going. AJ missing about half the game so far. Bryce Callahan missing a couple of games, and now he's going to miss three more. I mean, what more can this guy have done? He's the little Dutch boy with his finger in the dike. Every time he gets a hole plugged, another one springs open. Yeah, and to answer the question, as always, it's never just black or white. It's never cut and dry. It's never one or the other. They're, they're all been complicit, except for the front office for the most part. It's been the players and the coaches. My mind, though, it's more on – the, the the coaching staff. I'm not going to get on them when Locke throws a bad pick or Justin Simmons whiffs on a Sam Darnold touchdown. That's on the coaches. That's on the players. That's execution. That's all them. But you know, you look at you talk about the pandemic, Chad. Every team went through it this this year, this offseason. Every team lost the same amount of reps. And you have quarterbacks like Joe Burrow playing very well. You have uh, Kyler Murray playing very well this year. You have teams like the Niners who are more injury racked or comparable to the Broncos. They just upset, upset the Rams. So to me, it's what the Broncos have done in light of all this, in light of the injuries, in light of the pandemic. And when Pat Shermer can't get his best guy involved or he won't run the ball with Philip Lindsay or, or bash him every single week, that to me is on the coaches. And with Vic Fangio too, we talk about his situational management, all the, his clock management, his, his timeouts, what he does on the sideline, and also defense. What about cutting Devontae Bosby, playing Devontae Harris over him? It's things like that, you know, not blitzing enough. So for sure to me, the players have been complicit. They haven't been perfect, but the coaches, offense mostly, but somewhat on defense, have let them down this year, I think, big time. <laughs> The Queen jumping in. <clears throat> Good to see you, Christy. Appreciate you as always, my friend. She says, do what it takes to get this organization and team right. Hope for the best. Love. Thanks, guys. Yeah, I mean, there's still five games left this year. We'll see. I think we're going to know by the end of Sunday evening exactly what tenor this remaining season is going to is going to take on for the Broncos. Robot says, uh, I see us going four and one. What was that? Uh Next five games, wins against KC, Vegas, L.A., Carolina, a loss to the Bills. Let's see if I'm right. Hey, that'd be cool, man. Uh, Kenneth it. Booker wants to know uh, on a super chat. Appreciate you, bro. Do you think teams will try to steal Bill Kalar? Uh, maybe they'll try. But, guys, um, Mike Munchak wasn't the first assistant to sign with the Broncos because of a family tie in Denver. Bill Kalar moved here not just because Wade Phillips, his old boss in Houston, became the D.C. back in 2015, but because he has – grandbabies in Denver as well. So I think it would take quite a lot, especially Bill Kalar's old, you know, yeah. he's got a ring now. He's, he, it's, it's about fit, comfort, uh, all that for Bill Kalar. So unless he was relieved of duties in Denver and chose that he wanted to continue coaching, I really don't see that as being, being an issue that. It's funny you, meant, you mentioned this, Kenneth. I actually, um, I quote tweeted a few days ago, I believe it was Field Gates, who mentioned a lot of assistants around the NFL who could be uh, head coaching candidates, mostly coordinators and uh, assistant head coaches. But I said, Bill Kalar, I, it always surprised me he never got a shot. He has the temperament. He has the results. and He can back it up. I love how he barks and curses on the sideline. I always thought he'd make a great DC, but it never struck me like he wanted the job. Some guys are better at being number twos, and I think he was always comfortable being the best assistant rather than being maybe a middling coordinator. Great guy, though. And, you know, and there's a difference between being the drill sergeant and being the general that has to make tactical moves. Sure. In the, and I, I just don't think that's, that's ever really really been his bag, per se. I mean, I don't know that. But, Brian, by the way, 
Appreciate that super chat, my friend. Hashtag let them hate indeed. Means a lot to us, dog. Uh, James Moss uh, jumping in as well. Can't say next man up when the next man is the ball boy. <laughs> True, That's that. Pretty sad. True that. True uh, that. We got one. We got one from uh, David Kilgore. It's been a minute since we've seen one of our favorite superstars in the Huddle Up podcast live stream. Appreciate you, my friend. Good to see you as always. Love your your YouTube pick. is just it makes us proud. He says, "Do you guys see us going after Sewell in the draft if we lose out, or is uh, a defensive back a better choice?" I think if you didn't get Dar- uh, Garrett Bowles wrapped up, then maybe Sewell. But at this stage, you're tied to Juwan James next year. I mean, you have to play. You have to roll with Juwan James next year, unless you can trade him. But uh, I don't see Sewell as being a realistic building block. The Broncos will seek, even if they end up in the top three or four, which is what it would take to even have a shot at Sewell in 2021. Yeah, it's a good question. In my mind, a potential franchise tackle, a blocker for your hopeful franchise quarterback always trumps a defender. You mentioned uh, Juwan James' contract. You mentioned Garrett Bowles' contract. I'm still looking for that guy they can put behind him. I, I don't trust Juwan James to last even – uh, uh, training camp next year, Chad, if he gets a hangnail. And I don't really trust <laughs> Garrett Bowles going forward to fulfill that all those four years of his extension. I just want some insurance behind those two guys. He's the best tackle in the draft, so uh, he could be an instant impact day one, locked in starter if need be. I'm probably pulling the trigger on that guy just in case. Can't have enough linemen. Not allowed here, jumping in. <clears throat> Appreciate you, my friend. Good to see you. Do you guys think if Alabama star receiver Devonta Smith is available at our draft pick, we get him if there's not a valuable enough offensive lineman or corner? I mean, the Broncos have wide receivers coming out their ears, dude. I mean, Sutton, Judy, Hamler, Timmy P now stepping up. I mean, that's just not – I really don't see them trying to go for a wideout, even one as talented as Smith in the first round. But I've been wrong before, especially as it relates to receivers in the draft. You know, I've been wrong before. And don't forget 2020 MVP Kendall Hinton, Chad, at receiver. So the Broncos can't – they don't really need anybody else. I mean, it'd be great to reunite Jerry Judy with his former teammate, but you need other positions way before you need receivers. All right, guys, we're about to dip on out of here. Uh, We got one or two more, two or three more maybe. We got to really rapid fire them, though, because we're running along, Zach. So rapid fire style for KB here. Any thoughts on the ridiculous Jerry Jones comment? And for those of you who missed it, Zach, explain what that comment was. He, he pretty much said when the Cowboys, for those who don't know, the Cowboys lost Dak Prescott, a quarterback. They had Andy Dalton. They lost Andy Dalton to a concussion. They started a seventh round rookie named Ben DiNucci against the Eagles. He was predictably terrible. And what Jerry Jones was saying is that what the Broncos went through having to start Kendall Hinton was comparable, if not better than what the Cowboys were put through having to start Ben DiNucci and then someone named Garrett Gilbert the following week. Don't read too much into it. It's Jerry Jones being Jerry Jones, saying off the wall things and always putting his face and the team in front of the story. He always wants his name to be associated with the story. It's just him being him. That's one thing I learned covering the Cowboys. Who will say anything? Because uh, two really lackluster quarterbacks, but whose sole focus and entire job and responsibility is being a, a quarterback is worse than a practice squad wide receiver that's an undrafted rookie who's ne- hasn't played quarterback in two and a half years. On one day's notice. On on Yeah, on four hours worth of, of prep time. That's really worse. Uh, Glenn, good to see you, my dog. Glenn Hauser. Uh, by the way, this is a man that made it onto the NFL Network the other day. I saw that on Facebook, Glenn. Um, one of his tweets was featured, I think, to um, uh, Kurt Warner. So congrats on that, my dog. Very Your little cool. 15 seconds of fame there. Uh, he says, do you guys know if there have been two straight weeks where the starting offense or defense has been the same? Injuries have been deadly. Hashtag MHH. Hashtag Little Dutch. Boy. <laughs> um, That's funny. Yeah. Um, well, defensively, no. Offensively, week one and maybe week six. No, because they didn't have Melvin in week six. That's a good question, Glenn. Um, I'll have to uh, ponder that with all the other existential, you know, <laughs> queries that are dwelled deep in my heart. <laughs> yeah, I can't think of that on top of my head. It, it wouldn't surprise me if the answer is no, though. I mean, but, but but your point is well taken. I mean, it's that's the kind of year it's been. Uh, Mr. Castillo jumping in. Appreciate you, my friend. He says, "How is this year Elway's fault? With the issues of the 2020 season, the rumor of Ellis being the reason Shanahan is not coaching the team, Mike Shanahan, that is." I mean, yeah, the, we've been saying that on this podcast for a while now that, you know, even though Elway bears the ultimate, he, you know, the buck stops with him. I think as as Zach did a good job explaining earlier in tonight's show, 
he's turned over a new leaf and displayed that from 2018 on. He's been very good in the draft for the most part, made really good decisions in free agency and on the trade market. Um, this was just a bad luck deal. And unfortunately with the curveballs, the football gods threw the Broncos this year, um, Vic Fangio was just not, and his staff were just not good enough to weather that storm. And that's not even necessarily an indictment on Fangio. I mean, how many coaches really could have weathered that storm with excellence? I'm not sure there are many that exist, but Fangio just hasn't quite been good enough himself. Same goes for Pat Shermer. Same goes for Tom McMahon by a large margin. Uh, the only argument you can make if you want to blame the season on Elway, which I don't subscribe to at all, is he hired the coaches that were failing the Broncos this year. If you think the Broncos coaches are the bigger uh, culprit for the way the season's gone, Elway hired those guys, so that's on him. But like I mentioned, I exonerate him almost completely because he built the team around Drew Locke. He had the, the, the personnel in place. He had the right idea, the right mindset to attack this season, and it should have been, Chad. What's so maddening and frustrating, it should have been a 9 or 10 win season. It should have been a play off season, but things outside Elway's control mitigated that. I can't put it on John. Appreciate you, Stu, mate, by the way, on that super sticker. Uh, Paul, 826, jumping in. Good to see you, my friend. This is a guy that's been a longtime MHH podcast listener, reading the, the articles at milehighhuddle.com, commenting, engaging on social. We really appreciate you, Paul, and you are, are dedicated to every show on the Mile High Huddle uh, roster here, every podcast. So he says, uh, can MHH buy the Broncos fan uh, buy the Broncos Fangio and Locke need signature wins. Maybe we can get one in the last five. A great pod. Thanks buddy. Yeah. I mean, uh, I wish we had the scratch to put together to make a, an honest bid on the Broncos, but yeah, Fangio and Locke, I think the Dolphins win was a signature win. Right. Then Zach, it's punctuated by that. Just, it was an abomination. What, what more can we say about last week? Yeah, I was going to say that was Fangio's signature win, and I think the Chargers' comeback was Locke's signature win of this season, so we've already seen that. But if they manage to upset the Chiefs this Sunday, that is by far and away the crowning achievement of the Fangio and Locke era. All right, guys, we have loved talking to you all today. Appreciate each and every one of you being in the stream with us. It's always a blast, and it's just the the best part of our day. So thanks for, for spending some time with us this evening. Make sure you follow the podcast on Twitter. Zach, there's just been more and more of our listeners taking this call to action to heart, following on Twitter, creating Twitter accounts so that they can follow. It's just another way to keep the conversation going. And it's especially crucial if you're one of our Super Chat superstars because it's one of the ways we like to show you some love and in whatever modest way we can, you know, thank you for supporting us the way that you do is by tagging you and reaching out and naming you on, on Twitter after each pod. So, uh, follow the, the podcast on Twitter at Huddle Up Pod, the main account at Mile High Huddle. Those two, if you have them checked, you won't miss anything as it relates to the pod or breaking Broncos news and analysis. My partner, Zach Kelberman at Kelberman NFL, myself at Chad N. Jensen, and then our producer, John K at John K MHH. Don't forget to get your risk uh, free week of, of sports betting up to a thousand bucks at sportsbetting.com slash Mile High Huddle. Don't forget that slash Mile High Huddle though because it lets them know we sent you. Uh, check out the merch store, gang, if you're in a position to. It's another great way to support what we're doing here, and we do really appreciate it. But that's got to do it for today, gang. And, Zach, we'll be back tomorrow night for the, the Mile High Mailbag before we sign off in, until Sunday. So it'll be interesting to see how it all shakes out, but uh, have a great rest of your night, my friend. You too. Our favorite pod of the week. Anyone has any questions before the pod, be sure to hit us up on Twitter, tag us, You know, shoot us a question. We'll be sure to answer it on the pod. See you guys then. My last salute. You've been listening to the Huddle Up Podcast. Join Broncos Country's deep divers at milehighhuddle.com to keep the conversation going.